Well, good morning, everyone. And we welcome you to the House Ag Committee and Congressman Colin Peterson's town hall meeting. What a great turnout today. This is fantastic to have a good turnout. Unfortunately, the reason people are turning out isn't so wonderful. We've got difficult times out in farm country, and I've been doing this a lot of years. We've been through some ups and downs. In fact, Jim Nichols is over here somewhere, a good friend of mine, and he knows what it was like in the 80s when we had some real difficult times. We certainly are having those right now. Colin Peterson is a terrific voice for agriculture in this country and for this district of Minnesota, and we're very fortunate to have him in Congress. I've seen him in action. He truly will work with everyone, and that's what it's all about. I think that's what we all want. We want people that are gonna work together to get the job done and not play politics, just simply get the work done, and that's what Colin does each and every day in Washington. He also isn't afraid to tell it like it is. Sometimes you uh, get in trouble for that, but that's okay. And he does a terrific job on that too. Also today, Aaron Ziemer is gonna be our moderator. He is the uh, news director at KMHL and Marshall, and we want to thank Titan Equipment and KMHL for making the internet feed available all over the state of Minnesota and all over the country today. And we appreciate them uh, being with us. And again, Colin, great to have you here. And Aaron, I'm gonna turn it over to you to make the introduction. Thank you, Lynn. Wow, what a turnout today, as Lynn said. This is, uh, this is a, 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 big, a big thing we're here to talk about today with the uh, current farm situation and with you know, the, the spring planning and things like that. So just out of curiosity, of the farmers out here, how many of you have crops in the ground right now? How many of you have all of your crops in the ground? That's pretty much what we thought. So. Yeah, it, is, uh, been a, uh, it has been a spring, no question about that. Uh, a couple of people we want to th say thank you to before we get started. Uh, I want to say thank you to our broadcast partners for this event, uh, Titan Machinery here in Marshall. Uh, we appreciate their support. We also appreciate Ag, uh, Ag Country Financial for joining us here on the broadcast as well. So thank you uh, to both of them for help making the broadcast possible today. And a big thank you to uh, Bello Kachina for hosting this event uh, here. Uh, Sarah and her uh, staff do a wonderful job. They do have a lunch buffet after this, so if you want to stick around, um, there's a, a full pasta bar, full salad bar uh, buffet that they'll be having right in the restaurant afterwards. So we just want to say thank you to them, and if you want to hang around and be a part of that, I know they would certainly appreciate it. Big thanks to Lynn, and now we'll uh, get things started. We'll hand it off to our Congressman Colin Peterson here in just a second. If you do have a question and you're in the audience, there is a microphone back there for our audience on Facebook and TV and on radio. We ask that you uh, go ahead and read it into the microphone. I will also be helping moderate some questions as well. So without any further ado, here is Congressman Peterson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, we're going to Rather than have a bunch of formal statements and so forth, we're just going to open this up for people. Hopefully we can keep it under control and uh, won't get too out of, out of hand here, but uh, we'll see. Um, and I know that you um, all are wanting to know the specifics of what's going on here so you can make your decisions. And um, unfortunately, I'm probably going to disappoint you. Uh, I'm not going to be able to tell you exactly, um, but I can give you some indication of where I think this is heading. Um, so I don't know where to start exactly, but I'm, I'm going to go back to when we did the farm bill. Um, I tried to get those guys to improve the safety net in the farm bill. Uh, and I argued all through the last year that this farm bill it was not going to be adequate for what we're facing. And uh, I think people now see that I was right. Uh, so we could have, you know, I don't know where we'd have found the money, but we, you know, we're finding now, you know, uh, 14 billion out of this latest deal they're going to do, and we had, you know, 12 billion last time. You know, if we'd have had that money, we could have we could have got the target prices of corn over four bucks, you know, and soybeans up to 1050, and your bankers would be a heck of a lot happier if you had that kind of situation than what you have. 
So we tried. Um, I was kind of a lone voice in that process and was told by Mr. Roberts and Mr. Conaway that, well, we don't have any money and we can't do that. And, and the Iowa corn growers insisted on uh, reestablishing the ARC, which cost a lot of money, which I don't think it does much good. But anyway, so we tried. Um, but in, in the, at the end of the day, I made a decision uh, that I was going to do whatever I had to do to get this farm bill done. And it was not easy. And I'll guarantee you this, if I wouldn't have been at the table, you would not have a farm bill today. I can tell you that for a fact. Uh, so I had to swallow a bunch of stuff I didn't want to do. Uh, you know, they had to swallow some they didn't want to do, but we got the thing done, and it was a damn miracle. <laughs> you know, and right at the end, and most people don't know this, but uh, we had everything worked out. And I went to my caucus, and I was given a standing ovation in my caucus by the Democrats. And the reason was because the Republicans gave up the food stamp stuff they were trying to do. So the Republicans did something I've not been able to do in 30 years in politics. They made me a hero with liberal Democrats. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so we had, the, we had the Democrats on board and the Republicans, you know, mostly on board except for the Freedom Caucus. And uh, I thought everything's good. So we go to Rules Committee Tuesday night and, you know, Conway and I, for the first time in six months, are on the same page. We're saying good things about each other. You know, everything looks good. I come to the floor the next morning and uh, Conway comes over and says, you got to help me out or we're going to lose the bill. I said, what's going on? Well, in the middle of the night, Paul Ryan had put a provision into the rule that said that we couldn't deal with the Yemen situation with the Saudi Arabia. And all the peace activists went nuts. And you know, a bunch of Republicans were not going to vote for the rule. The Democrats were all against the rule because of this provision. And I had to go out and find some Democrats to help the Republicans pass that rule. And if we wouldn't have done that that night, that morning, uh, we wouldn't have a farm bill because we'd got drug into the shutdown and we'd have never got this thing done. And I caught holy hell, and I'm still catching holy hell from the peace activists and the other Democrats that I got to vote for this bill uh, because they were upset because they wanted to whatever. So it's just one thing after, it's like uh, Winston Churchill said, it's just one damn thing after another, you know? But, but anyway, uh, we got it done, and it's not the best, but at least you got something you can count on, and you know what it is, and you know, you know, you take it to the bank for whatever it's worth. So then, you know, we got into these uh, tr trade things and, and uh, you know, they did the, the market facilitation payment, which people needed, I, I get that, but, uh, you know, we've, I've spent 20 some years trying to get the government out of agriculture, you know, not get them further in and we're going the wrong direction. Uh, and now we got another one on the table. So. All of that history, you know, uh, people got the payment last year. I think everybody appreciated it. It didn't make people well, you know, but it helped. Uh, so now, you know, we're facing even a worse price situation. And now you've got the problem with the weather in this part of the world. Um, so they're doing another uh, facilitation payment. So maybe I'll start with that, um, where that's at. Um, Somebody has convinced their economist and um, the other leadership at USDA that the most important thing about this facilitation payment is that it doesn't affect planning decisions. So they came up with this scheme, which in my opinion will affect planning decisions more than anything else they could have done. You know, and I've been telling Sensky and Purdue and Northey that you guys are making a huge mistake with what you're doing here and all you've got to do is wait three weeks and the planning will be over and it, you won't have to go through all of this stuff. But they have got this in their head that they've got to do this uh, formula and I think part of its reaction to what happened in the last facilitation payment where the soybeans got a buck sixty-five and corn got a buck a penny and 
wheat got 16 cents, whatever it was. So there's a lot of unhappiness about that. They got a lot of flack about that. So now they're coming up with a scheme that you would not be able to figure out. I don't care if you were the world genius economist or, or uh, whoever, uh, the way they've got this thing put together, uh, nobody will be able to figure out what they're doing. Uh, so what they're going to do is you're going to go in and uh, sign up you know, your planted acres. And so the one thing I can tell you for sure that this is going to be based on planted acres. And if you don't plant, you're not going to get this payment. So that's one of the first problems. You got to make so then, if you had preventive planting, you know, are you going to get more out of that? <laughs> or are you going to get more out of the market facilitation? You know, who knows? Uh, so that's the first issue. Uh, but that's, you know, uh, I think that's pretty well solidified. They're not going to pay you if you don't plant. And so they have expanded the, um, the list of crops that are going to qualify for planted acres. And so, for example, uh, even alfalfa will be considered planted. Uh, and that has something that uh, hasn't happened in the past where alfalfa got left out of a lot of this stuff. But uh, you can plant alfalfa, uh, you can plant um, no, just about anything, you know, canola, dry peas, uh, mustard seed, uh, rapeseed, um, oats, you know. so. You can plant just about anything and, and get it considered as planted acres. Um, the, so then, in the process, what they're going to do is they're going to go back and they're going to figure out the history in that county of what the relationship of the crops are to each other. So they're going to go back, and, and it's not clear if it's one year or three years or whatever, but they're going to figure out, okay, in Lyon County, so historically, you plant 50% coybeans, 50% corn, and that's what it's going to be, okay? And that's probably close to what it is, you know. So they're going to figure out what it is that they've planted in those counties. Then they're going to take the uh, APH yield, the county average yield, times those um, acreages. And it's not clear at that point where they might use planted acres plugged into that versus historical, but that hasn't been worked out. But anyway, what they're going to do is they're going to come up with a per acre payment for that county based on what your historical plantings were in that county and based on how much damage they think was done to that particular crop. So if you have corn, you know, it, they're going to say it doesn't have much damage from these trade agreements. If you got soybeans, it's going to be significant damage. Wheat, significant damage, so forth. So it's not clear what they're going to do with that. Uh, there's been some rumors. It's going to be $2 for cor uh, soybeans, um, you know, 10 cents for corn, uh, 63 cents for wheat. Uh, but they are denying that that report is true. They're claiming it's not true. And so you can't find out from them what they're going to do. But they're going to come up with a per acre payment for Lyon County or Lincoln County or Pipestone County or whatever. Now, I can guarantee you that these payments are going to be significantly different from county to county. And so you're going to have another issue where farmers in one county are going to get $5, $10 an acre less than the county in the next, next door. So that's going to cause problems, I think. You know, uh, and people are going to, they're already starting to question why they're using county average yields and why they're not using historical, you know, all this other stuff. Um, so I don't know. So the economists that have looked at this uh, think that, you know, we're talking, I've seen the ranges from $25 an acre to $100 an acre or higher. Uh, and I don't think anybody has any idea. Uh, what it is, other than it's going to be on your planted acres and it's going to be so much an acre, and you're not going to know that until August, probably. And then they're talking about making the 50% of the payment in August, and then they're going to see what happens, and if they feel like the trade stuff hasn't damaged you, they're not going to make the rest of those payments. Uh, so they're going to decide in December 
if they need to make more, and then they're going to decide again in January if they need to make more than that. So, you know, they've got this thing set up. So, so the idea is that this is not supposed to affect planning, okay? So this thing, because of what they're doing here, is going to affect planning more than anything else they could do. Because your payment is going to be based on what you plant. You know? And so you tell me that people aren't going to switch from soybeans to be uh, corn to beans to get this payment, if they can get them in. You know, I just think that's what's going to happen. So we're going to end up with more soybeans that we don't need, <laughs> you know, because of this program. So I said, why don't you wait three weeks? If you wait three weeks, we won't need to do any of this stuff because everybody's going to be planted or not planted. We're going to be past the deadlines. And, you know, even Chuck Grassley agrees with me on that, that this is what they should do. But they will not listen, you know, so they're hell-bent on doing this program. And the one message I want to have you understand is I have nothing to do with this. <laughs> you know, I mean, serious. I have no, this is an administration deal. And all, and all they do talk to me and they do listen to me. I mean, well, they l hear what I say. I don't think they actually listen to me. But this is not my call. This is their call. This is completely the administration, uh, their decision, completely, and they're taking this money out of the CCC. Now, most of you probably don't understand about the CCC, but this is something that was set up in 1939 in the Depression. And it's a mandatory pot of money that the slush fund that the secretary has. And he can spend up to 30 billion a year out of that fund if he decides it needs to be spent. So that's where they're coming up with this money out of the CCC. And they've got sufficient money in there to do it, uh, although the money is gonna be borrowed and we're gonna pay interest to China, which I think is kind of stupid, that we're gonna borrow money from China, pay interest to them so we can fix the problem that we created with China. You know. I don't know. Anyway, so that's where they're getting the money. This is completely done by the uh, Secretary of the Administration. The Congress has zero impact on this. We have nothing to say about it. And, you know, I spent an hour on the phone with Northey yesterday. Northey is the Undersecretary for FSA, Farm Programs, Crop Insurance. I went through all this stuff with him, just like I just did with you, telling him I think they're making a mistake. It didn't seem to have much uh, impact. So they're moving ahead with this. So I, I wish I could tell you that this is going to be 50 bucks an acre. You know, then you could make a decision. You go to your crop insurance agent, you can figure out, you know, what the preventive planning situation is and, you know, try to figure out what makes sense. But we're, you're not going to know. Okay, so that's the facilitation payment. So now the other wrinkle is, we have a disaster bill, and that's been going on for the last, I don't know, uh, six months at least. Uh, they've been putting together this disaster bill, and I have been supporting them on this. Uh, this had nothing to do with us. This disaster bill was for the South, uh, and you think you're in trouble? You are not anywhere near the trouble that these people in Georgia and Alabama and Florida are in because of what's happened to them the last three years, especially last year. And this disaster bill, they needed it in February or January. And I would say 25% of those farmers are out of business because we didn't get this done. You know, so they've been dragging this out and the Senate has been fighting with each other and Trump has been against it. Uh, and so finally last Thursday, the Republicans in the Senate got the uh, Trump to agree to a deal. And so they came up with a $19 billion disaster bill that they passed 95 to four or something like that on Thursday. But the problem is the house had already left town. Uh, so uh, they sent it over to the house, we're gone. So they tried to bring it up under unanimous consent. And what that means is that the, that the House would just accede to the Senate, that we would not question anything, we would just unanimously approve it, even though nobody was there. 
And Nancy Pelosi, to her credit, agreed to that because she knew how tr much trouble these guys were in the South and, and some people in this part of the world too. So she agreed to, even though we didn't agree with everything that was in there and so forth, she agreed to let it be brought up on unanimous consent and so did McCarthy on the Republican side. But they had this one Yehu from the Freedom Caucus stood up and objected. And so, uh, so he uh, objected, this guy uh, Chip Roy, who's a freshman from Texas, who used to be Ted Cruz's chief of staff, so if that tells you anything. Uh, he, he learned his farming from the Heritage Foundation. But anyway, um, so he objected. And so then they got him to agree not to come back to Washington. Uh, this was on Tuesday. And so they brought it up again, or no, what, Monday. They brought it up again yesterday. And then this Massey from Kentucky, uh, he stood up and objected. So now they're going to try it again today. I don't know what's going to happen, but when we get back to Washington on Tuesday, uh, if they haven't passed it by then, I think the House will pass it. Uh, and so the disaster bill will be law. Now, so this was a bill for the South, and because a lot of the crops in the South didn't have crop insurance, and they needed this in order to survive. So in the middle of this, and this not getting done, we had the flooding on the Illinois or the Missouri River and so forth, and what's going on here. And Chuck Grassley got involved and said, we got to have money for our disaster, even though most of it is covered by crop insurance. You know, so our part of the world is different than the South because everybody's got crop insurance, basically. And, you know, you're covered for rented planning or whatever else. The only thing that wasn't covered was the grain bins. Uh, and the grain that was destroyed by this flood. Now, you could have bought insurance. I checked with the insurance companies, and you could have bought insurance on the bins and on the grain, but most people didn't. You know, and it was fairly cheap, you know. But anyway, so what they ended up doing is they put into this disaster bill that if you lost grain or grain bins, you're going to get paid for the, by the government for your loss. The other thing they put in there, and this is the other wrinkle that's going to go in tension with the market facilitation payments, they put in there that they're going to be able to plus up the prevented planning up to a maximum of 90 percent. So they could take your prevented planning, which I think is 60 percent on corn and 55 on soybeans, or the other way around, okay, 55 percent on corn, 60 on soybeans. Now the secretary would have the authority to raise that to 90 percent under, under the end. So one thing that Northey told me that they're going to do, uh, if, you have, if you have crop insurance and you have prevented planning, what they're going to do is they're going to have the crop insurance companies do that. So they're going to come up with something and they're going to tell the crop insurance, okay, if you had preventing planning, you can raise that to 75 percent or you can raise it, they could go to 90 percent. Uh, and they're not going to do that through the government, they're going to do that through crop insurance, okay? But they don't know what they're going to do. They know it'll be more than 55 and it'll be less than 90, but they don't know what it is. Uh, so that's another wrinkle in this whole decision making that you've got to do and you're not going to know. And I don't think you're going to know anytime soon w what that is. Uh, so I can pretty much tell you in talking to Northy yesterday, it's not going to be 90 percent. I can tell you that. It, you know, maybe 75, I don't know. And so if you don't have crop insurance, this is another bone of contention, uh, you, they can pay you up to 70 percent on preventive planning even though you didn't buy insurance. Now that's not fair, but that's what they did. You know, and, and Grassley did this. And Grassley should know better, for Christ's sakes. You know, so this is, this is call, uh, causing moral hazard with crop insurance if we start paying for people that don't buy insurance. But, and again, they don't know what they're going to do. Uh, it could be 70%, it could be 50%, it could be who knows. So those are decisions they're going to make. Um, those payments, if you don't have crop insurance, those preventive planning payments are going to be made by the FSA office. So you'll have to go in and apply at the FSA to get a payment if you're not with crop insurance. And so again, 
the Senate did this bill without listening to us in the House. So I sound like I'm laying the blame off, but it's the honest to God truth. Those guys wrote this bill. I didn't have a damn thing to say about it, <laughs> other than to support what was in there for the Southerners. And, uh, you know, the only option I have now is I could come back on Tuesday and I could object and, and throw this thing into, um, into a conference committee, but who the hell knows what would come out if it would ever get anything out of it. So I, I don't think I'm going to do that, but, you know, like I could tell people, the Senate could screw up a one-car parade, you know? <clears throat> and uh, they have done it again, you know? So, so what they have done here, in my opinion, is that they have significantly impacted planning decisions. They have put you in an impossible situation to try to figure out what the hell to do. And, you know, the advice I got from some of the top economists was, well, what you guys should do is plant what you think is the best economics for your farm and not worry about what the government is going to pay you. And that might be good advice, I don't know. But probably whatever you do, you're going to wish that you would have made a different decision when you find out what actually happens. Uh, so, you know, I can tell you this, that if the Ag Committee was writing this market facilitation, and if the Ag Committee was writing this disaster bill, this would not be what you're facing, I guarantee you. You know, but we were not basically consultant. So, you know, with all of that good news, uh, what am I missing? Um, you know, it's, so it's a crapshoot, whatever the heck they're going to do. And um, I don't think Northey is going to make a decision within the next couple of weeks on either one of these things. And, um, if they do, they probably wouldn't tell me. Or they're surely not going to tell you. Uh, they'll probably be leaked information out, so I would be skeptical about what you read on the internet or any other place, because I don't think anybody really knows. And uh, there's going to be a lot of fake news coming out. But Anyway, um, so <laughs> I'm here to take advice. Uh, for whatever it's worth, I'm not sure anybody will listen to me, but... Um, I'm willing to weigh in on your behalf. I have been weighing in on your behalf. I have been complaining about this for um, some time, uh, these facilitation payments. I think uh, they've screwed that up, and um, there's better ways to do this, but anyway. So, uh, and you're going to be, there's going to be payments for hogs. Uh, we're not sure how much, but there will be so much a hog payment, so much, uh, I think it's even for cattle. Uh, milk, there's going to be so much 100 weight payments for, for milk. Uh, so there'll be other payments made in this uh, latest $16 billion besides crops. And then they're also going to buy up stuff, um, you know, like surplus uh, pork or milk or whatever else. Uh, at one time, Trump said, we're going to spend the whole $16 billion buying up products. And then somebody explained to him that there was no way you could do that. So he changed that that afternoon. <laughs> anyway. All right. So uh, you got a question? So you'll have to speak up because I'm kind of deaf, but um, I'll do the best I can. All right. Well, if you do have a question, please feel free to come back here. This will be the microphone we will use. Uh, we do have some back here to get started. We just ask that you be... Um, kind of cognizant of the camera locations when you are setting up a line if one starts to form. So we'll turn it over to a couple of you for some questions. Good morning, Congressman. Thank you for being here. I'm Don Buell from Tyler. And uh, I guess I'm curious if we think we could get this USMCA passed. Uh, exports are important, I think, to everybody in this room. And I'd just like your comments on that. Yeah, I think it's going to happen. Uh, there seems to be um, movement that's positive. The Ways and Means Committee is going to Mexico next week uh, to e examine the labor standards, which means they're trying to figure out how to 
be able to sell this to the rest of the Democrats. So I'm optimistic. I think this will get done this fall. You know, uh, I don't think it'll get done before August recess. It might, but I'm more likely be September or October. Uh, but frankly, the agreement is not much different than the current NAFTA. So the fact that NAFTA is still in place, you know, I don't think we're really losing a whole lot. You know, if it gets delayed a couple months, uh, there is some improvements over NAFTA, but not significant. And it depends on what sector of agriculture you're talking about. So, but I think it's going to get done. And I've supported it the minute it came out. I told the administration, I told Lighthizer, I had lunch with him. I said, if you don't screw up the ag stuff, I'll support it. And they didn't screw it up. They made it a little better. And I immediately came out in favor of it. And I have talked to Pelosi, as they've asked me to do, to tell her to bring it up. But I just would warn people that she is the best vote counter in the House. And part of why she's not charging to bring it up is she doesn't think the votes are there right now. Yeah, but we're working through that, and I think she understands this needs to get passed. And so, like I say, I'm optimistic. Uh, and I think I'll do whatever I can to grease the skids and get her done. You know, we don't need that problem on top of everything else. Hi, Congressman. Um, I'm a dairy farmer on my family farm. My mom and dad bought in 1945. What I don't understand is how the new dairy price program of 950, when we got paid 1330 in December and 1330 in January base price, and I talked to Katie in your office, so she figured out my deficiency payment for January. And the top price that you're using is 1680. How do you come up with that when we're getting paid 1330? So you got to add 360 onto that or 350. Well, you're you're dairy farming in the wrong state, <laughs> uh, and that, that's a flippant answer. But the problem is we have such uh, low class one utilization, and we're a manufacturing um, market. The Upper Midwest market is a manufacturing market. We have very little class one, and so. Our prices are a buck and two a hundred weight below prices in other places because of you know very low utilization. Unfortunately, and there's no other way to do this, and I knew this at the time we did the program, but it's the best we could do. Uh, this program is a national program, so they com they compute the feed costs nationally, and they compute the price nationally, and when they come up with this uh, margin. It's not based on Minnesota. It's based on your national price. And so what's happening is we're getting penalized like a buck a hundredweight in Minnesota from what they're getting other places because of our market. Uh, th there was no other way to do this. I mean, it, you know, there's, you, it has to be a national program. So I just think that people need to step back and look at this in, in the right way. And I don't, I think too many people dairy farmers and crop farmers have looked at things based on what they're going to get out of the government. And that's the wrong way to look at it. And it's especially the wrong way to look at it on dairy. So what we have done with this 950 margin is we have guaranteed you a price. Uh, and in the case of Minnesota, we're basically guaranteeing you a $17 price. You know, I'm, from what I'm seeing from the economics of the situation. So if, if, you're a, if you've got 200 cows and you take the 950, you know, you can lock in a gross income, you know, of around $850,000 a year. And that's the way you need to look at this. You need to go in and buy this coverage. You can then take this to the bank and say, okay, I know I'm going to get $850,000 on my operation no matter what happens. And if the market's better, I'm going to get more. Uh, but people aren't looking at it that way. They're looking at it, well, how much money is the government going to send me? That's not what this is about. This is about giving you a safety net that your banker can count on, like we do with crop farming. You know, when you buy insurance, you can go in and say, okay, I know I'm going to get this much uh, income because I bought this coverage. So, um, you know, it, it, it's... <laughs> It's a national program, and that's how come we're in this situation. 
The other thing that you need to understand is we have a significant amount of people in this country and in Minnesota that can produce milk, they claim, for 14 bucks a hundredweight. And that's the other issue. Uh, and the people that claim they can produce milk for that are increasing production. You know, so whether they can or not, I'm not, you know, that's their business, but that is an issue that we try to deal with by limiting who gets this 950 coverage. That's what we've done. So, so the people that claim that, if you go to their farms, they're going to have illegal people working for them, and I guarantee you they're illegal. They probably what do. What has happened is we don't have a level playing field to play on anymore. Well, I can't do anything about it's that. It's a big I, hill. I can't do anything about that. I've tried to get immigration reform. Uh, you've got people that are never going to come together on that issue, and so it is what it is. But, you know, you got the hog operation, not the hog farmers, but okay. Hormel and Jenny O, they got illegal people in their operations too. That is correct. Yeah. My second question is going to be concerning the hog operations. The what? Because my second question will be concerning the hog operations. Yeah. You mentioned paying the hog farmers. Right. Okay. First, I want to say what I come out of my question from the dairy farm is, or for a family dairy farmer in Minnesota, we might as well fold up and go away because this isn't for us anymore. That's not true. I think this is the best time in my career in politics at 40 years to go into dairy farming. This is the best time. If you want a dairy farm, that I say to people, if you're a young guy and you want to do it, this is the time to do it. Because we have a five-year guarantee of gross income that you can buy for almost nothing. Uh, we have cows that are selling at 40% of what they're worth. We have barns sitting empty that you can lease. If you want to get into dairying, this is the time to do it. And I can't guarantee that this five-year program is going to be extended, but I can about 90% guarantee to tell you that it's going to, and it'll probably be improved in the future. So we have a safety net in place for small farmers. Now, you get above 220 cows, you're on your own. Uh, that's the way it works. But I just, I, I just think this negative stuff, I know it's been terrible, and again, the Senate, this program was available in February, uh, early February of 2018. There was a bill at the time that I tried to get it into, and the Senate objected. And if that bill would have passed, you would have gotten $100,000 from the government in 2018. And the only reason you did it was because the Senate killed it. You know, so that same program now is in effect for 19 but the prices have improved, so you're not going to get as much money. But you would have got 100 grand last year if we'd have got that thing in place. There was no reason not to do it, except the couple senators that didn't understand what they were doing. You know, so I mean, you know, it, I mean, I'm in a powerful position in agriculture, but I'm not a dictator. <laughs> you know, I wished I was sometimes. You know, that I could do what I think needs to be done, but you know, I got to work with all these other people. So. Do the state representatives and state senators ever confer with you as a national person to uh, help dic you know, get back to us what's going on with you? Uh, not too much. Um, and I just found out yesterday that the okay. state legislature put in pro uh, place a program to pay part of your premiums on the market facilitation. Uh, and. They obviously didn't know what they were doing because they, they're paying up to 750 cows. And the amount that you have to pay for uh, M uh, margin protection over 220 is, there's no way you would ever pay that. So now they've got a program where the state is on the hook to pay for something that doesn't make any sense economically. If they would have just called me, I could have told them this is a bad idea, but nobody called me. So. Okay, my last comment is when you're going to pay the hog farmers, I want you to consider who they are. And I feel sorry for the family hog farmers yet because the number one pork kill place in the United States is China. Yeah. The number two is JBS out of Brazil. Right. Now, on WNEX radio this last spring or last fall, when this all came about and Trump put all these tariffs upon, he said it's a win-win for China because they're killing the hogs raised by the USA, shipping them to China, and getting paid the tariffs both ways. Thank you. 
Well, I don't know about that, but um, you know, the, that's another factor that I maybe should have. Um, I, in my opinion, the tariffs are the smallest part of these price problems. Uh, the number one problem is China's swine fever. Over 30% of their hogs have been killed, and it may be 50% by the time they're done. So the market for soybeans went away. And when I was in Brazil and Argentina a month ago, there was no buying by China in Brazil and Argentina because they don't need their meal, they don't need their beans. And that's part of the reason why the soybean market has collapsed. It has more to do with that than anything else. That's number one. You know, number two, we have produced too damn many soybeans. And we got more soybeans than the market can take, even if China didn't have this problem. So that's overhanging the market. And then you add on top of that the tariffs. So you got a perfect storm here. And that's, you know, what's going on with these prices. And I, my opinion, and I'm not an economist, um, I think these prices are down for the long term. I don't see these prices coming back in the next two or three years. I really don't. And I think we're at, heading into a time that's going to be as worse or ba as bad as the 80s that we had back in 85, I think, unfortunately. And I hope I'm wrong, but I might not be. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, hi, Representative P Peterson. I'm Dale Johnson, um, a crop and livestock producer. And uh, with the um, preventative plan acres, what I'd like to see is that uh, final harvest date, haying and grazing, moved up to like September 1st rather than November. Then we can get some feed, because it's going to be a dire situation with uh, the way the, the wet fields and uh, the, the problem of getting uh, feed harvested. So I, I'm not, I, I'm not, say that again. Well, I'd like to see that preventative plant date where, where you could uh, pay or graze on preventative planted acres moved up. From oh, you mean have being able to harvest them? Right. Well, that would take, I believe, uh, well, that would take legislative action to change that. And you can see how easy it is to get anything done in Congress these days. So I think, you know, we, we can work on that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, suggest that we um, uh, make some other changes, you know, in the law to try to deal with this. I'm not sure we're going to be able to do that, but I will try. So that, that's not a bad idea, and I'll work on it, but it's damn hard to get anything done. And even if we can get it out of the House, that doesn't mean the Senate's going to take it up, you know, so but that's not a bad idea. I appreciate your influence on that. Thank you. Yeah. Huh? I did. It, it doesn't, it's, it's like talking to the wall, okay? <laughs> Yeah, you know, I don't think he has the authority. He's going to tell me, you know, a lot of what they, they're blaming their lawyers, okay? They blame their lawyers for this um, market facilitation fiasco uh, to some extent, and the economists. Uh, but, you know, and the lawyers over there, they do screw up a lot of stuff, you know, and I tell the people, maybe the best thing we can do is first kill all the lawyers, and then after that we can make progress. But. Um, Anyway, uh, you know, it's, we'll, we'll talk to them, but it so far hasn't done much good, unfortunately. Yes, sir. Congressman Peterman, Peterson, Scott Double D, the manager of the Farmer's Elevator in Hanley Falls. I'd like to throw an idea out for discussion. Maybe it's a bad idea, but to consider extending the full payment of crop insurance on planting date a couple of weeks. And right. Then, we can still raise good corn, provided we can get it planted right a couple of weeks late. Corn's a large economic engine for our region, for our state, for our country and the world, and maybe it could solve a lot of issues. Thank you. Well, the planting dates are in the regulations, and as I understand it, I think I'm right about this, that the, they can't change those without doing a, a rule which takes 90 days notice and a whole bunch of other stuff. So I'm not sure, even if they wanted to, they could change those planning dates on a timely basis. Uh, we have legislatively before changed those dates, but we, you know, we had to happen to have a bill that we could stick it in. Now, 
this disaster bill, I mean, if they opened that up, we could put something like this in there. And if they would have had me over in that discussion that went on over in the Senate, I would have told them, you know, to, change, to look at these planning dates in terms of a way to deal with this, if you're worried about planning decisions. But nobody allowed us into the deal, so. I, I you know, not a bad idea. Uh, Jerome Graff, Sanborn, Minnesota. Uh, I happened to be reading something the other day about uh, ethanol and, uh, and the gas production, or the demand, I should say, of it, rather than production, but the demand of it. They're projecting it to be going down as we go ahead. So, did we lose a lot of export business to China over that? Over what? Over the export of ethanol? Um, <laughs> well, that's a lot more complicated question. Um, you know, the ethanol market um, is being distorted by what's being done in different countries, including the tariffs. Um, you know, we were getting ethanol into South America because of what they were doing. They were sending biodiesel up here because of their, their government policies in Argentina. Um, I don't know if you ever get ahead of this situation, you know, but the market also puts out signals and sometimes they need ethanol and sometimes we need it and vice versa. You know, we don't want to get in the way of that. So how much, I think a bigger problem with ethanol is what the administration has been doing. Uh, they claim they're for E15, but they're mucking up the system with these waivers. And so they haven't done what they're supposed to do. They claim they're doing it, but they're not doing it. This is fake news, you know. So, uh, you know, that, that would be a bigger help to the ethanol and corn price industry uh, than anything else. If we could just get them to implement the E15 year round and not screw it up, uh, you know, with these waivers. Because those waivers are not justified, in my opinion, and they're just, they're flouting the law, but, you know, we've sued them, but we can't get a judge to understand what the hell's going on here. So I don't think the exports one way or the other are going to solve the ethanol problem, I guess the bottom line. The main point was down the road 20 years as they go to electric cars and more efficient vehicles, the total demand for gas and ethanol is going to go down. What about the vehicles? I need a the, the demand for ethanol and gas is going to, the demand for it is going to get lower because of the electric cars and I suppose more efficient vehicles, I don't know. Well, who, who knows? I, I don't think there are going to be a lot of electric cars sold in the 7th District. So, uh, <clears throat> it's my take. Yes, sir. Uh, Representative Peterson, my name is Mark Pankinen. I am a uh, farmer feeder near Lamberton, Minnesota, and I also represent the Minnesota State Cattlemen. Uh, the gentleman, I believe two, two previous to myself, had brought up the prevent plant acres and the potential to open it up uh, prior to the traditional November 1st grazing and haying, if we could move it to September 1st. Your response was, it takes a lot to get stuff done in Washington, I understand that. I, I think you can do this. I think if it could be uh, somehow presented uh, yeah. along the emergency I, haying and grazing, which I think there's a good CRP. chance of, we can get them to do that. It makes sense. Uh, and I don't know exactly what they have to go through, but they probably got enough time by September 1st to go through the rulemaking if they have to do that. And so yeah. I will definitely talk to them about that. Uh, but I also want to say to you that in the Farm Bill, we opened up CRP to grazing every year and haying every other year. So we significantly opened up CRP. And most people don't know that. That, you know, the other thing, we doubled the grassland reserve program. You know what that is? Yes. You know, and so we now have four million acres. And only a million of it has been used. And, and you get the grassland reserve payment if you just have grass. And you don't have to do anything with it. All it has to be is pasture, any kind of grass. You can sign it up, you get 20 bucks an acre. And there's no requirement to do anything. You can graze it, hay it, 
whatever you want. And people are not signing up. And this is a big mistake. You guys are leaving a lot of money on the table that you could be getting. So you can put all your pasture land in, just go down to your FSA office, and you can sign up any day you want to do it. We need yeah. productivity, and a yeah. lot of the makers you know, are so really you not, ought to, not You guys productive. should get into this thing because it'll make a big difference. You know. All right, but, thank you. Okay. And we're trying to shoot the wolves, but we're not having much luck. So <laughs> got to get the governor straightened out. Representative Peterson, Bob Worth, Lake Benton. I want to thank you very much for taking the time to come down and explain a lot of things. I actually have two questions. First one is, I'm a, I'm a farmer, but I'm also a mayor of our town. And I am really concerned what's going to happen to our businesses in town, the fertilizer guy, seed guy, you know, all these, all these businesses that rely on agriculture. And if, if things, if the farmers don't have any excess cash to spend in these businesses, we're gonna, our small towns are gonna wipe up. And that's, I, I, I like what you explained about, you know, maybe we get a little more for prevent plant, whatever we can get to help our businesses out. I mean, I, it's, I'm just worried about small towns. We might not have anything left after. I mean, this is the sixth year of agriculture is really suffering, and this is going to be a, a big one, and that's going to just take the take a total on them. So, thank you. Yeah, it, you know, um, as I've heard from people around the district, apparently in some of these areas, like I guess around here, uh, the uh, companies still have all their fertilizers sitting in the bin because you've right. Uh, so there, some of these co-ops and other suppliers are not in the greatest shape either. Uh, and there's not going to be any help for them out of any of these programs that I'm aware of. Uh, so, you know, it's, I'm worried about where we're heading with this thing. You know, I'm, I was there in the 80s, saw what happened then, and um, uh, all we can do is try to, you know, do the most help we can to get, get people through it. But, um, and the other thing, the bankers, you know, they're going to have some tough decisions to make too. I think next winter, is going to be hell on wheels, you know, for uh, the bankers. I mean, I, I had them in my office just um, three weeks ago. You know, they said most people got financed this year, but they're very concerned about what's going to happen next year, especially given the prices and given uh, what the weather has been and so forth. So we'll just have to do the best we can, but they've, they've already increased the levels of uh, Chapter 12 bankruptcy. Uh, try to do some things there to help things out. That's not the greatest idea in the world to help people go bankrupt, but you know that might be uh, part of what you have to do. We're also putting money into the um, mitigation or the people that mediation people and the other mental health people. We've had a lot of increase in suicides uh, in agriculture, especially in the South. Uh, so you know we put more money into some of those programs, but we need a price. And we need good weather. <laughs> That's yeah, the best thing we sure. can do. But as farmers get money in their pocket, no matter through a government well, they spend product, it. Yeah. They spend it. Yeah. So that's, I mean, we don't keep it. Yep. We spend it. I and I, I was, I'm old enough to know what the 80s were like. I, I lived know. the 80s. Second question is, on, could you explain a little bit on the new program of the ARC and the PLC and the new, and the new farm bill? I know we're, we're going to, it's changed some. I'd like you to explain that because we have to sign up for that sometime this late Yeah, summer. you've got till late summer. Yeah, I think it's September 1st or something. Well, Thank you. Um, we did, we were, I tried to raise the target prices and it was unsuccessful. But what I did do is I raised the loan rates. And I don't know if any of you have noticed that, but we did have a 15% increase in loan rates and that happened because of me. <laughs> And I insisted on it. That was the one thing I insisted on. It's not a magic bullet, but it helps. It's a little extra money you can get for your cash flow and so forth. And so those loan rates have been raised for the first time in 20 years. Uh, so the biggest other change that we made in, um, in PLC and ARC is that you can go back and forth. Uh, you can go back and forth every year. So you can go in PLC one year, ARC the next, back and forth. 
and you'll be able to make that decision every year. Uh, under the old program, it was a five-year deal and you were locked in. So that's the other big change we made to give you some more flexibility. But in this part of the world, I'm expecting most everybody is going to go with PLC. You know, I'm thinking, but I could be wrong. Jim? Colin, thank you. Jim Nichols. Well, farmers need to understand, and some misinformation is that all they have to do is call their crop insurance agent today right. or tomorrow, and then they're automatically enrolled in the program for preventive planting. But they can continue to go ahead and plant corn if they want to, and hopefully we'll have a good week this week and we can get some corn planted. Beans are $7.50 in Marshall yesterday. I mean, there's, there's no money in raising beans, and we don't need them anyhow. We need to raise some more corn, right. and that would certainly help our co-ops. And, and they've always been there to support us, and now we need to help them. The other thing is back to the, the November 1 date for being able to get any of that preventive plant. You can plant a cover crop on the preventive plant, and you can bale it. You can't chop it. But if, we, if you can move that ahead at least one month, which is what CRP is, it would help a lot. And I know you've talked to Northy about that, but the other speakers have spoke to that. Move that date back to September 1 would be great. And that helps our livestock producers. And for the farmers, call your crop insurance agent. That's all you got to do. You're signed up. And if you want to plant corn, plant corn. Yeah, I, thank you. I should have mentioned that. I was not aware of that. But you could, apparently you should sign up for preventive planting with your crop insurance agent, even if you're not going to do it. Uh, and you can sign up, and then you can decide later whether you're going to, whether you're, you'll find out later whether you plant or not. Is that correct? Correct, and you don't have to. A lot of crop insurance agents and ones here, they're going to sign up their customers anyhow because you're crazy if you don't sign up. And you don't have to decide how many acres of corn you're going to prevent plant. Just call your agent. He automatically signs you up. The claim is filed, and then you can do what you want. So, but tomorrow's the deadline for that call. Yeah, and then they've got, you know, these issues where if you've got an enterprise unit, you've got to plant uh, 20 acres in every enterprise or 20 percent and, and those kind of issues. Um, you know, and it just all makes it more complicated to try to figure out what the hell to do. So. But you got till June 25th on those enterprises, right, so don't right. worry about that now. And all you got to have is 20% in two right. sections. So but It's apparently an issue because I've gotten calls from yeah. a number of people about that. So I don't know. Anything else we haven't covered? Yes, sir. I'm Kelly Nichols. I'm a crop insurance agent. Colin. Um, I've already got three text messages after your announcement that we could go from 55 to 90 percent on prevent plant payments. On what? Uh, when you mentioned that we could go from 55 to 90 percent within the disaster bill on prevent plant payments. Well, we don't know. They can go up to 90 percent. We don't know what they're going to do. I understand that. Is that actually wording in the, if the disaster bill passes, is that wording in the disaster bill or is it up to the Ag Secretary to announce that number. It's, it's up to the Ag Secretary to announce what number it is up to 90%. Do you think it's going to be increased? Yes. Do you want to make a guess? No. <laughs> <laughs> Can I give you the name of about 75 farmers that would like to know that number? <laughs> <laughs> well, we could go to Las Vegas too, you know, so. <clears throat> What's that? Uh, that's a good question, but uh, every county, 51 counties in Minnesota are disaster counties already, okay, including Lyon County. In my opinion, all of the counties in Southwest are already disaster, so I don't think it's going to be an issue, uh, as far as I know. Uh, in fact, there's, there's counties that are disaster that have had no disaster whatsoever. How the hell they got in there, I don't know, but um, so... You know, I don't think that's going to be an issue. Uh, so, you know, I, I talking to Northy yesterday, there's no question they're going to raise that. Um, my guess, and don't hold me to this, but I, I'm guessing they're going to go in the middle. They're probably going to go 70, 75 percent. You know, I'm guessing if you have insurance. But who knows what they'll do, you know. So you're just going to have to look at your operation and... Do the best you can. That's all you can do, I guess. Yes, Jim. Colin, can you make a guess? We're going to get a payment for every acre we plant, too. Thank God for that. Make so a guess on what that might be. The, the, the facilitation payments? Yes. Well, I don't know. I read this morning, uh, 
you know, if we don't know what numbers they're going to use. Um, I think this $2 number on soybeans was actually a real number. And when it got put in the press, they backed off. Uh, so if it's $2 and if it's 7 cents for corn, which is what I saw, you know, what they've... Um, so what you're talking about is if you're a county that's 50-50, uh, corn, soybeans. So, and your county yield is what, 45 acres, 45 bushels? You know, 50 bushels to make it simpler. Uh, so, say your county yield is 50 bushels and you're 50 50 county. Um, you know, so you're talking, um, you know, what, 50 bushels at what, eight bucks, seven bucks, what, whatever the, I don't know what number they're going to use, uh, but say it's eight dollars. 50 bushels is $400 an acre, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's what they're going to do. They're going to multiply that out, and then they're going to translate that into a county. So if, you, if you're 50% soybeans, and that's 400 bucks an acre, and if you're 50% corn, and that's zero, then you're talking 200 bucks. Now, you know, I don't think it's going to be $200, but it, it could be 100 That'd be for every acre that we plant. Right, so, so it makes no difference what you plant. Beans. Or, for example, if you plant alfalfa, yeah. you turn your whole farm into alfalfa, you still get a payment. Because uh, it's county average, it don't matter what we plant, how many acres of corn or beans, it's a per acre payment on all. You can put in canola, you can put in oats, you can put in corn, whatever you want, you know. Uh, to get that payment. So, I don't know, it's, um, you guys are smarter than I am and you've got, you can't get in the field so you've got a lot of time to sit around and think. Uh, <laughs> which I can, get, I can attest to because I've been getting all these calls from guys. But anyway, how are we doing here? Well, thank you very much, uh, all of you, I appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to the MC here and um, Kent, we appreciate you being here. Uh, he's been feeding me some information. Are you a real economist, or are you, uh, uh, you got a degree? No. no. Oh, I got a degree. You're, you're kind of like me. Yeah. You're a half-baked economist, right? <laughs> anyway, Kent does a great job. And thanks to Lynn Kettleson. And, uh, oh, we got one more question. You probably can't see me, so I won't hold it against you. Um, you know, in ag, we employ one out of 12 people in the United States. If 30% of the farmers do prevent plant, um, John Deere already announced 20% production decrease for the second year in a row. Is Congress working on anything for anybody outside of farming? So what I mean by outside of farming is actual farmers. So ag retailers, no. wholesale, no equipment. No. I mean, to me, that's something that we're well, getting to the point where that needs to be considered. We, we've never done that, and so given what's going on, it's tough to set a new precedent, set a new program. I think there's some validity that uh, these folks in these rural communities have been hurt uh, by these trade agreements, probably more than uh, farmers have, uh, but it, it's just not been something we've done. So at this point, there's been no talk about that. Uh, I have raised it in some of the farm deal discussions about whether we ought to be thinking about more than just farmers. But as of right now, I've heard no discussion about it. Uh, to me, the scary thing is, is it's not, it's not a Southwest Minnesota deal right now. I, it's nationwide. Yeah, no, and, I know. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's real. And the discussions need to at least to start to happen. I mean, I, I, we all know that it's not going to happen overnight, and it could happen in a year or two years from now, but I don't want to happen what happened to GM in 2008 happen in ag. And looking forward, that's, that's a real now. scenario. Well, we'll keep an eye on it, and we will be talking about this kind of thing, but again, these bills that I've, we're talking about did not come through my committee. Uh, you know, generally the only thing we have jurisdiction over is the farm bill. You know, uh, when I got the farm bill done in December, uh, I said I worked very hard 
to make sure that I had nothing to do when I was chairman <laughs> because that's the reality of the situation. You know, once you got the farm bill done, you basically oversight, um, you know, watching them on implementation, trying to get them to do the right kind of things, and beyond that, waiting for the next farm bill. Uh, so that's kind of where we're at. Whenever you have a disaster bill, it gets done in the Appropriations Committee. So all of a sudden you got people putting this together that have no clue what they're doing. And that's part of the problem. And then you get the Senate involved, that's even a bigger problem, you know. So, anyway. Thank you all very much. Oh, we've got one more. Uh, then I'm going to hang it up. So, yes, sir. Congressman Peterson, I'm a beginning farmer in Lincoln County. And um, I've struggled a little bit with farming or crop insurance costs. So if I don't farm outside of a section, my uh, premium is almost double what an enterprise unit is. Um, now, that would be great for, you know, you said earlier it's a good opportunity for people to start. You were talking more to dairy, but it'd be great for me if I could cut my costs on that. And then the second problem I'm running into, as a beginning farmer, I don't have a proven yield. So I get stuck with the county average, and the land I am renting is capable of more than the county average, but I'm still stuck with the county average yields. We, we, we under, you know, I think we understand most of what you're saying, and we have you know, developed these beginning farmer programs, which have helped significantly. We have help with crop insurance that wasn't there before, programs to help you guys get started. We haven't been able to put everything in there that we want. You know, uh, we've tried, but you know, it's, it's like again. Appreciate if you keep trying, I appreciate yeah. anything you do. And then part of it is it somewhat gets hijacked by people that have other fish to fry, okay? That wanna take these programs and turn them into some kind of do-gooder thing and therefore the money's not available for the real farmers you know so we got some of that going on we try to limit that as much as possible but um, we get it and you know talk to grant and write that stuff down and we'll make sure we don't forget about it and grant uh, herfindahl over here who now works for me uh, grant was the state uh, director of fsa for a while uh, before that, he worked uh, Maker, Maker County, uh, Douglas County, and Grant? No. Polk. Pope County. Okay. So he's got a long history of working at FSA at the county level, at the state level. He knows his stuff, and he helps me from, uh, keeps me from doing too many stupid things uh, when I get off on a tangent. And uh, he's available if you need somebody to talk to. He farms right north of Benson, and pardon, and he's uh, works out of the Wilmer office, so you can get a hold of him. And Meg Lawadri, uh, who runs our Marshall office, is back here. I think most of you in this area know Meg. She's been with us a long time, and uh, she's also available if you have something you want to talk to us about or get information to me. So thank you all very much. I appreciate it, and good day. Just want to say thank you a couple more uh, times once again to our uh, broadcast partners, Titan Machinery and uh, Ag Country uh, Farm Credit Services uh, for joining us here in the broadcast today on KMHL. Big thank you to everybody for coming and of course, uh, Bello Kachina uh, for hosting this event here today. Don't forget they do have that, uh, that pasta bar and salad bar in there for lunch if you want to continue the conversation. Thank you again everybody for coming and, and have a great day and a nice weekend.